listening to Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Hello. Hey. We're back with... Yet another interview with a normal person, a normal person I really like. Well, as if I would say, (laughs) yeah, this one I'm feeling only half-hearted about. (laughs) I mean, we like all of our normal people. (laughs) I wouldn't ask them to come on the podcast unless I really like them. And I thought they had a good story to tell. Like all of our people, period. I don't know what story exactly you're about to hear because guess what? I haven't had this conversation with her yet. As of the time we're recording this, I'm talking to her tonight. So it will be fun for me and for everyone else who's about to listen to this to discover what we're about to talk about. But I just admire Kayla a lot for how far she's come. And I don't know how much she's going to want to share of her journey and her story, but I just know in general that she has had a lot of difficulties that she's had to work through and overcome. And she has like really weathered it with a lot of grace and has like turned a corner recently and is feeling so much better and like life is working out. But for a long time, gosh, we were having conversations there for a few months where it was just like, she was like, I don't know, Rachel, I just don't know if anything's ever going to work out. And I'm like, I hear you. And I'm so glad to say that that is no longer the case. So I don't know, maybe take heart in that. Maybe that's what we'll talk about. I mean, that's, that's very relatable. We've all been through phases where you're like, I don't know. I just don't know know about this. This one. And then maybe this is going to be the end of me. And then it always ends. Yeah. It's always a phase. So that's, that's reassuring. So we'll, we'll get a little, I'm sure you'll get a little bit more into what. Well, now I kind of have to, because I brought it up in the intro. (laughs) So now I have to make sure I talk to her about this, which I'm sure I will. So anyway, here is Kayla's bio. Kayla is a thriver through and through. Five passion profile quizzes taken over the last seven years have confirmed this. She's also an INFJ highly sensitive person, Enneagram type two, and a Pisces. Like, she's, no wonder we like her. You know what I mean? She's got a lot going on. Yeah. She's got a lot going on. <laughs> Professionally, she works in human resources, helping people make informed decisions about important aspects of their lives. She spends her very precious free time either with her husband and their little circus of animals. I can relate to that. She really does have a circus of animals. I've been witness to the craziness. Not just dogs, then, I guess. Lots of oh, animals. no, they adopted, they they took in a mother cat who had kittens this past summer, and she was, like, single-handedly taking care of this whole brood of little kittens and then getting them adopted, and it was such oh. an ordeal, but she did just successfully adopt out all of the kittens, oh, so that was great. Very good of her. Yeah, she's a little, like, Snow White with the animals. I love that. Okay, so she's either with her circus animals in her husband or <laughs> out hiking the Mount Hood Wilderness in Columbia River Gorge. Mm -hmm. She lives in a very beautiful spot of the world Mm -hmm. with all of her animals, much like Snow White would. Cool. So (laughs) checks out. (laughs) And also works in HR, much like Snow White did not. (laughs) So honestly, she should go to HR for that. Like, you know, some guy kissing her when she was absolutely unconscious. Absolutely go to HR about that. That is a violation. And he should be, he should be, he should lose his job. (laughs) I I really think so. Oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Kayla that I haven't had yet, but by the time you're listening to it, it's here. <laughs> okay, we'll be back at the end. Hi, Kayla. Hi, Rachel. How exciting is this? I'm really excited. <laughs> like I said, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm anxious and excited. I think that's a very appropriate word that I honestly should be <laughs> using all of the time in mm-hmm. my life, and I'm not. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. So it totally understandable to be excited. <laughs> and like, I think most everyone I ever have a normal person to interview with says that. And then like five minutes later, they forget that 
they're being yeah. recorded and we're just talking. So I think that will ha that's happening here too already, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So I pulled up our notes because this is, <laughs> and I don't know why, but this is like just where I want to start. Okay. Okay. The very first thing you told me, like how we're just diving in. I'm like, no preface, no prologue. Let's do it. Let's, Let's just yeah. dive into the deep end, like literally 30 seconds in. What okay? else is there to do, really? Uh, exactly. <laughs> One of the, literally the first bullet point I have written down in the notes I took from our very first session is, mm -hmm. my therapist told me that my family <laughs> trauma definitely impacts the kind of work I've chosen. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yeah. So like... Okay, so let's back up for a second because I want to explore that. But yeah. you have been like I've known of you for a very long time because yeah. you've sort of been in the clarity verse, I guess, you know, like for many, many years now. Yes. Like we've literally done multiple of our decade. courses. Like, oh, I know it's kind of an <laughs> it's kind of scary that yeah. I now have people who can literally say, Oh, I've been following mm -hmm. you for 10 years. I'm like, I don't want to think about that. Don't Please make stop. me think yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But you're one of those people. I, mm -hmm. but, I, but I find it so interesting that I only like started working with you like one-on-one -on -one less yeah. than a year ago, like last spring. Yeah. So I want to explore that theme because I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people need to hear it. But I kind of want to go back and talk about like, how that theme was maybe playing out over the years up until we met. Like, what was your work life and your career like? Yeah. <laughs> it's just so funny to think about. Like, of course, that would be one of the first things that I say. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> um, where do I even start with that? I think, well, okay, just to like, let's just dive right on in. I come from you know, divorced parents from when I was like 14, right before high school started, super formative years. And by the time I got to college, I didn't really have like an idea of what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. And I was working for a local government and I told somebody about a class I was taking. It was like conflict resolution because I was like, oh yeah, it might be nice to learn how to do things differently than my parents because, you know, <laughs> they're not exactly having fun. Um, and when I told somebody that, they were like, well, you should check out this mediation program that we have here. And so like long story short, I looked into it. I started volunteering. I ended up basing like my entire college degree on conflict resolution and communication and I did that for like six years. So I worked as a mediator for that government entity for six years. And I learned a lot and I really, really enjoyed it. I loved the people that I worked with. And after six years, I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't really need to be doing this anymore and managing people and their conflicts. Um, I was just, I was ready for something new. And so that was kind of like, that was in my mid twenties. And then by the time I was like 30, I was sort of starting to try to figure out now, like what comes next and kind of job hopped a little while. And the next job I had after that didn't last long. It was like mediation on steroids. Honestly, it was so bad. I was having like panic attacks. It was pretty oh, no. it was rough. And like you clearly didn't get out of mediation right? No, I didn't. It was just, it was so different. And the job changed from like what I thought it was going to be. And that was really disappointing. And then COVID hit like while I was looking for jobs. And so I spent the better part of a year looking. And then I got into like this great gig working in human resources, um, helping like people plan their retirement and benefits. And then I was recruited into the fertility industry, um, working with surrogates and intended parents. Uh, I have like personal experience in the fertility industry. I was an egg donor. And so the agency that I was an egg donor with, they recruited me and it was a really good opportunity and I, I didn't want to pass it up. So I left the job mm -hmm. that I liked at human resources and 
started this other job that like was my dream job for like a year. It was everything I'd ever wanted, everything of like a thrive ever could ever want, like mm. not thinking about it at the end of the day, super, super flexible, rarely worked 40 hours a week, but I was paid like a salaried, you know, 40 hour a week employee. And it was really great. And then it shifted a lot. And essentially I had to take over all of these responsibilities that I hadn't been properly trained on. It, it was a little rough for a while. And I quickly learned that like, that was not for me, but I was still interested in the industry. <laughs> so I went and found a different job <laughs> in the industry that I thought would be better because it wasn't quite doing the same thing. And three months into that, I was like, oops, I made a terrible choice. And this is kind of like where the therapy piece comes in because so many of the jobs that I have had, I think almost literally every one of them at this point have had female leaders. And I had come to realize that I had, I just had some pretty gnarly like attachment issues around feminine energy, females in particular. And of course, some of that stems from my relationship with my own mother and, you know, even going back like her relationship with her mother, my relationship with my grandmother. So that was something that my therapist pointed out to me as I was, you know, trying to figure out like, what's going on? Like, what am I not understanding here? I, I feel like I'm doing all of this work to try to like set different boundaries and to say when things aren't acceptable anymore. And then I keep going back into the same mm. thing. And that was really like an epiphany moment when, she, you know, she was like, all of those people are like women. And is there a thread in there that like you want to try to unravel a little bit? So, um, yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> I mean, there's so much more to it. It's I not, know. It's not I'm just already like, like maternal. There's also a lot of, yeah. you know, father stuff in there, people pleasing, not wanting to disappoint anybody. Being yeah. overly responsible, I'm sure, as the always child, oh, you know. Yes, absolutely. Perfectionism. Yeah. Hardcore perfectionism. Like cannot yeah. get things wrong. And yeah. Yeah. That thread that your therapist pointed out. I would like to tug on it for a second too. <laughs> let's let's I, go. <laughs> yeah. I would just love to hear a little more if you're willing to share about mm -hmm. like, what was the through line? Like, what was the pattern that kept repeating itself with these female authority figures? I think it's, it's challenging because like the, when I worked in mediation, that the director that I had there, she was incredible. I mean, she felt almost kind of like a surrogate mom to me for a while. Mm -hmm. And then that shifted like a little bit, you know, she had her own stuff come up and then at that point, I was just kind of like ready to leave that. But it was like from there on trying to like, I guess, find that again and not finding yeah. it. Just constantly finding the people that like were letting me down, right? The people that were taking advantage of basically like what I was willing to offer of, you know, my skills, my knowledge, and then also like gaslighting me on certain things or telling me that what I was doing wasn't quite good enough, even though I was definitely going above and beyond, absolutely exceeding what was expected. And that was really like the critical piece, but like critical without actually having legitimate ways of doing something differently. Um, just that kind of like, oh, why didn't this thing get done? And it's like, well, I was never told that that was a thing that I needed to get done. You know, just kind of mm -hmm. like them not having their shit together and expecting other people to just pick up the pieces, but never sharing what those pieces were. And then getting pissed yeah. off when something fell to the wayside that needed to be done. Um, and expecting you to just guess and mind read. 
Yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah. That, that in right there, that's it. You found it, Rachel. <laughs> it's the, it's the guessing. And then literally like the expectation that you should just know. And then like the sheer disappointment in you that you didn't know. And then the like admonishing. Yeah. Yep. That's, and I'm like, oh, of course this was so familiar to you. Mm, very, like, very like familiar. All of this was so familiar to you from yeah. your parents and their, uh, <laughs> the trauma that they handed <laughs> down to you. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. I like mean, the dysfunction you grew up in mm -hmm. that, where there was yeah. a lot of it. We don't have to get into the details necessarily yeah, of there was of, a lot of it, <laughs> but there was quite a lot of dysfunction in your, in your yeah. family. And so, of course, you were as the eldest child of parents who honestly were emotionally less mature than you, I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think for most of your life, you have seemed to me, from what I have witnessed, to be more mature than your parents. Yeah. I mean, and, I think that, that that's definitely true. I was yeah. the parent yeah. for both of my parents for mm -hmm. from a young age. I mean, yeah, like, we don't have to go into specifics, but, you know, I'm sure other listeners have the experience of dealing yeah. with not only like emotionally immature parents, but also parents who might have like addiction issues and how, like how much more that adds onto it. Oh like my the God. The caregiving that you're having to do for them that you're also having to give to yourself because they can't. And your siblings because they can't. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's. You were a parentified <laughs> child from a very young age. Yes. And so of course very you were young. a mind reader. You had to become a, <laughs> You had to be able to understand yeah. what these people needed, not only for mm -hmm. their sake, but for your own, like for to keep yeah. yourself surviving. And so it's like, yeah, absolutely. of course, like this is the point that I keep trying to like drill home is to people. And I hope they're getting it by now is like, if you don't <laughs> understand your own patterns to, to some degree, like that familial pattern, like the childhood pattern, mm -hmm. You're at such a yeah. disadvantage because you can't see how much you are replaying it in every mm -hmm. area of your life. And I'm going to go on a slight tangent right now. Okay, it's not a tangent. It's actually directly it. related, but I'm going to rant for a second, <laughs> which is that next month we're going to have an episode, another episode, a deep dive into attachment theory. Mm -hmm. And one of my biggest issues with how psychologists and therapists talk about attachment theory is that they talk about it being specifically about romantic relationships. And right. I am like... This is bananas that you can't see and you're not willing to acknowledge how it shows up in people's career and how it yeah. shows up in their relationship to authority figures. And to be honest, in some ways, our relationship to our authority figures in our job is more of a one-to-one -one comparison than, yes. than it is to a spouse sometimes yeah. because the spouse is not really an authority figure. Or they're not meant to be an authority figure. Right. Like, Obviously, yeah. they are important, and obviously, our survival can often depend on them. But <laughs> I feel like the childhood stuff gets it can, for some people, get brought out way more intensely at work because of the nature of the relationship. Like yeah. there is a power dynamic in a it, like a big power difference in a way that ex exists exactly the same in childhood. I'm relying on this person for my survival. Yeah, and so of course, we then end up repeating a lot of those childhood patterns with these people. And if we don't see that, then we can't break the pattern. And so it took you how many years to notice or be told, right, to be called out on the fact that this was a pattern? Yeah. I mean, literally almost a decade. Like, yeah. I've been working with my therapist for almost a decade. I found Clarity on Fire almost a decade ago. <laughs> like, it's true. What's really interesting, too, is that I didn't have that, like that epiphany came not just from like my therapist, but I, around that same time, I listened to the episode that you and Kristen have about attachment styles at work. And my brain exploded. I was like, holy shit. This is like, this is one of the missing links that I've yes. had. Like, this is so vital. Um, and I really like being able to have that sort of hindsight view now, like I can see how true that was like that i'm excited you guys are coming out with another episode i mm -hmm. i really hope people will take that to heart a lot more attachment styles like it's not just for lovers it's for no, everybody <laughs> it's for it we all have baggage in that arena you yeah. can't because yeah. you can't escape it because we all had a childhood and none of us 
mm-hmm. went got out of childhood completely and utterly unscathed <laughs> with right. no programming yes. that's questionable right. that needs to be you know looked at you know yeah for sure so it's like no wonder when i met you you were very very tired you were yeah. very burnt out yeah i think you were just sort of at your wits end because you were in a job that was very toxic in a lot of yeah. ways yeah and also you had just been re- like running this program like over and over again with mm-hmm. d- at different jobs and some of the jobs were better and some of them were more toxic but a lot of the same themes were continuing to show up mm-hmm. at work over and over again which is again why i'm like we have to do this deeper work and we have to ask these deeper questions about what are my underlying patterns what are my underlying fears and beliefs and programming mm-hmm. because if not i'm going to wonder what's wrong why don't i like mediation anymore like right. do i need to go back to school yeah. like yeah. you're going to ask questions oh like that yeah for sure and you might literally spend tens of thousands of dollars to get an mba thinking well this will be this will reinvigorate my career when really what you needed was to like heal your mommy and daddy trauma so that yeah truly you could break a pattern and like find jobs that were more aligned with your current value system so anyway like i'm not surprised all that is to say i'm not surprised you were burnt out because that was what was under the surface yep and so um one of the okay i'm gonna go back to the notes because on the note (laughs) of burnout one of the things you know beyond the you know beyond the trauma and those patterns that were that were playing out one of your big limiting beliefs was that like you really you took you a while to get past this idea i think and maybe you're still working on it but you Mm -hmm. said i can't and this is so common that i have to share it because everyone Mm -hmm. I coach yeah. says this to some degree usually <laughs> is I can't get paid really good money unless I work really hard and burn mm. myself out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you were kind of in this place <laughs> where you felt really stuck because you're like, well, I'm burnt out and I feel like I've reached the end of my rope. Yeah. But like, I don't, I can't, this can't be the end of my rope if I want to make money and I want right. to like, like keep going. Right. Um, do you want to talk more about I don't I I would just like to hear you I don't know you reflect on that belief or that limitation. Yeah, I think that that was one of the biggest ones that I had and part of that definitely comes from just what I've seen around me, right? Like my dad pretty much always had some really challenging job and he was working crazy hours and even then like there was still struggle, you know, like financially with stuff. And looking on job boards, like doesn't help, you know, LinkedIn, everybody's talking about fast paced this and urgent that, and, you know, the pay, it feels like abysmal for some of the like job responsibilities that are listed in some of these jobs. And I think part of it too, is that, you know, over the, some of the jobs that I've had have demanded a lot, but have paid very poorly. Yeah. Yeah. And part of that is because there's not, you know, there wasn't at the time and still isn't for some of the industries like pay equity stuff done and, you know, studies on that or pay transparency was like not a thing. So there were times where I felt like I was working so hard and I was like, what the hell do I even have to show for this? Like, why am I, I'm not even making that much money. And now the thought of like, So, okay, I'm making X amount right now, working my ass off, and now I have to go find some other job that, quote, pays more. But what are those expectations going to be? Right. Like, that's where, that's kind of where I kept getting stuck because it was like, surely, if I'm only making this much now and I'm working as hard as I am, then anything that pays more is going to obviously require me to work way harder, Mm -hmm. like even harder, or or at the minimum, (laughs) the same amount of you know, hard that I'm working now. That was a really hard one for me to get past. I mean, I think that that's not that I'm completely over that. I think that that one definitely needs like more (laughs) massaging, (laughs) I think, but I do feel like I'm in a much better place now because you and I talked about it quite a bit. And, you know, you essentially just challenged me like, well, how is that actually true? Like, 
you know, where's the proof that that actually is true? And the reality is I don't have any proof because I haven't mm. worked in a higher, you know, until this point um, or until recently, I hadn't worked in a higher paying job that didn't require, mm -hmm. you know, crazy amounts of stress, crazy amounts of work, you know, constantly working over time yeah. or over, you know, full time. And I so, do. yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I just, I don't know what I told you, <laughs> but <laughs> what I wonder if I told you, I probably wrote it down, but I'm not looking at my notes. I right probably now. wrote it down somewhere too. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> sure. I mean, God, I, I talked to so many people. I'm like, I don't know who I, I, know, I told yeah. what to at this point. <laughs> yeah. but what I hope I told you and what I'm going to tell you and everyone else now is that first of all, I think logically it totally makes sense why we think this, right? It's like A yeah. plus B equals C, right? It's a right. formula. Right. If I have to work this hard to make this amount of money at this job, yeah. then it logically follows that I'm going to have to work even harder to make more money at the next job. Mm -hmm. And that feels completely unsustainable. Like I can't do that because I'm already at my wits end. So like, I right. guess I just have to make like way less money than I deserve for the rest of my life. <laughs> when I actually think in some ways, I think it's actually the opposite. I yeah. think that jobs that underpay people for valuable work, the kind of work that you do or have done historically, yeah. I feel like that is so classic, right? To like underpay people who mm -hmm. are, and like people like you who have a lot of baggage and trauma from childhood who have been like taught and reinforced to just accept as little as humanly possible and make do with yeah. it, right? And yeah. those types of jobs take advantage of that kind of programming. And yeah, for sure. And they often attract people who are at that, like who are at that um, level of belief. And right. so I think what actually happens or can happen is that the more someone's willing to pay you, the more they respect you. And the more they respect you, the more they have respect for your whole self, like your time and yeah. your energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more reasonable they might be. So yeah. I actually think that it can be the opposite, right? That if people yeah. are willing to pay you more, it might actually mean you get to work less because they treat you and see you as a full human and respect you yeah. accordingly. Yeah, that's such an interesting way to put it too. And it's not something that I had considered before, but I, it makes total sense, especially like when I consider where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll talk <laughs> about that because in that's, a bit. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Right. That they respect you more yes. than you were. Yes. That <laughs> I, but like, that's it. And like, yeah. it, it, you can, I feel like we see this in, in so many areas of life, right? Like the, the, the D bag guy who like wants to basically treat you like his girlfriend, but like not call you his girlfriend, right? Like, ooh, baby, yeah, right? been there. It, 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 haven't we all? Like that guy is gonna like try to you know suck the most life out of you possible mm -hmm. without giving you anything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the people, the guy who is willing to, the guy who treats you the best is the guy who isn't asking hardly anything of you. He just wants yeah. to like give things to you and oh pop God. you up and that support feels so you, right? Yeah. And it's like, it's because he actually cares about you and respects you. He's not, yeah. he's not a vampire. He's not trying to suck the life out of yeah. you. And like, that's what happens with a lot of these like low paying jobs that mm -hmm. like don't respect you and your humanity is they're literally yeah. just using you and they are sucking the life out of you. So no, I think for those of you who have had this fear, like, maybe this will be like a big paradigm changer that no, I think it's actually more likely that you could work less at a job that pays more because they respect you and they're more reasonable human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Kayla has had that experience now, which we will get into. Yay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, so fueled a little bit by just, so when I met you, you were burnt out. You were really, mm. really trying to make a transition, but like financially, you were like, hey, hey, it would be great to take a sabbatical. I can't do that. I got to stay in this job until I find another one. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. I mean, in some ways, yeah. it's it's better if you can stay in a job because at least then you're not putting all of this pressure and like 
stress on yourself, you know, like, yeah, I have to find a job immediately because I just quit and I only have a couple months worth of, you know, savings and I'm going to blow <laughs> right. through that. Like, that's not a great situation to be in. But it's also sucks that you were so burned out and you like couldn't really take a break and you had to like be yeah. looking for your next thing while you were in that one. And we identified that as a thriver, you weren't looking for like something vastly different than what you were already doing. Mm -hmm. Like you have a certain set of skills that yeah. are applicable in a lot of places. There are some aspects of what you have done in the past that you enjoy and would be happy to do again. And for you, like many thrivers, it was more about the environment and the yes. culture and yep. the people and like the respect and yes. like being able to like have a 40 hour or less work week mm -hmm. and being paid decently and like just having some like nice basic needs met was really what you were asking for. Like you weren't yes. shooting for the moon. You were like asking no. for very reasonable stuff. <laughs> yeah. But you really struggled. And like, to me, when I think about the, the summer, like, you know, you and I coaching over this past summer, mm. so much of it was just like, our calls would start with like, I don't know, Rachel, I just don't know. <laughs> like you were like, you were going yeah. through it. And I you was really, going through it. <laughs> you really doubted yeah. whether it was possible for you to make yeah. a transition. Like, and I have written down here, the universe shines upon certain people. Why am I being neglected? Have I not put in <laughs> enough work or suffering? This yeah. was a question you asked me back in June. Oh my God. It was so emo. <laughs> well, but it's genuinely how you felt. No, and I didn't it, believe it is. you. <laughs> yeah, it, it really was. It, it just kind of felt like at that at that point, it was like, I feel like I've been putting in the work. I feel like I've been, I've been doing the stuff that I'm supposed to be doing. I've read all of the Tosha Silver books. I'm, she's I'm, she's <laughs> trying to be outrageously open, you know? I'm trying to be outrageously open here. I think I'm doing, I'm trying, I'm really doing it. And it just felt like nothing was right. Like it just yeah. wasn't clicking. Nothing was clicking at the, the time. And I just kind of felt like, left behind and like betrayed a little bit by like the universe. I was like, Hey man, I'm still ah, here. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm <laughs> I cannot tell you how universal that experience is. Like it just, in yeah. my experience in pretty much everyone I've worked with, like, it's like a really difficult phase that I coach that I, I often find myself coaching people in where I'm like, I have no way to prove to you that this isn't going to last forever. And I have no way to convince you that you're wrong. Not to feel the way you're feeling, because you're totally justified to feel disappointed, to feel betrayed. Mm -hmm. Like, this is nor these are normal feelings to have. But I knew that it wasn't ultimately going to last and that it was not your truth with a capital T. Like, this was not how yeah. things were going to be forever. But it's hard to convince someone of that when they're going through it. And yeah. to a point, it's also, you know, it's also hard to, like, when we would coach, it was like, what we ended up talking about was just helping you, like, have a little bit more energy and faith around, like, okay, this is going to work out. And, like, I mm -hmm. can make it another two weeks. <laughs> and, right. like, I can, like, just, all right, I got to get, like, get my mind right around this. And it was just, like, mm-hmm reinforcing your like a little bit of an ability to trust that things were going to work out. Yeah. And that's all we did for like months, to be honest. Is that, that's yeah. what it felt like to me. Oh, that's definitely what it felt like to me. <laughs> yeah. That's absolutely what it felt like it. Yeah. So obviously that didn't turn out to be the case. Things did turn <laughs> yeah. around when, yeah. and again, I cannot, emphasize enough to everyone listening to this how much Kayla did not believe that was going to happen. Yes. It's like, very, very true. <laughs> she was pretty convinced that her lot in life was set and that things were not going to change and that yeah. it was going to be very, very impossible, almost impossible mm -hmm. for, th for things to get better. And I feel like this is what happens when we're in a bit of a depressive state is that... Mm -hmm getting what we ask for, even if what we're asking for is just completely reasonable. And there was nothing on your list that was unreasonable. Like 
in the mm-hmm. slightest, right? Like you're asking for something that's just like totally doable in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. But when you're feeling really dejected, that can start to feel like winning the lottery. Literally just like getting something <laughs> reasonable can start to feel like uh, a yeah. miraculous happenstance. That's very true. That's right? such a good way to put it. I had not thought about it that way, but that that is very true. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like yeah. it it literally felt like it would be a miracle of divine proportions for things to turn around for you. Yeah, it did. And I'm also it made me super thankful that I was not a fortune teller and didn't know how long I would have to stay in that job before getting into a new one. If I had known ahead of time, I probably just would have like put in the towel, crawled under a rock and yeah, stayed and that's there. It. I, that's it. Game over. <laughs> Kayla's out. Oh, goodbye. I think about that all the time in relation to my singledom. Oof, yeah. Like, if you had told me five years ago, like, hey, you're going to be single for five more years, just so you know, I would have been yeah. like, I... I I think I'm done here. I think this is a wrap for me on <laughs> yes. Earth. Like, yep. like check. wrap it up. We're yep. gone. I, like, <laughs> like I just I, I when I was 30, I genuinely didn't believe that I could I could handle like I could handle life if I was 35 and I was single. Which actually, the universe is a really good sense of humor because then I did meet a man literally the week I turned 35. <laughs> Of like, course you like, did. Like six days before. <laughs> well, of course you did. <laughs> That's because incredible. the universe is like that sometimes. <laughs> but I didn't know that it would that it was going anywhere. Do you know, at that time yeah, I didn't know. But like course. in hindsight, I, you know, it is funny that I actually did meet someone technically before I was 35. It's <laughs> amazing. But like under the wire. Like yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> off off track but not really no not really because I, that's how i felt too like i just felt yeah. like something that to me to other people just seems totally reasonable like you're looking at other people and you're like well they got a job and to me that literally would be like winning the lottery is is like how did they win the lottery or like that person yeah. got married like this literally feels like impossible for me to do even though it's actually kind of a normal thing that a lot of people do mm-hmm. it feels like i am somehow excluded from that and yeah. that's never going to happen for me. Yeah, truly. So I, I do enjoy sitting here with you, being able to say <laughs> on both of our fronts that we're talking about right now, hey, that didn't last forever. And yeah, it maybe <sighs> yes. lasted a lot longer than you wanted it to. <laughs> yeah. And it was really <laughs> difficult. But like, in fact, reasonable things can happen to you too. <laughs> that <laughs> are not totally actually miracles. Things. <laughs> they just feel like it because of what you've not had prior. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, when did things turn around? Like, because actually once they started to pick up, they picked up pretty quickly. And that is another sign, I think, yeah. of things going well, is that some one day, all of a sudden, things just, like, start to happen. Yeah. It's so... It's just so wild to think about. I just remember it was like early October and I had been thinking for quite a while, like, I think I want to get back into like the human resources field. There are a lot of different opportunities in there. And that's where I was at before I was recruited into the fertility industry. And so like, what would it be like if I, you know, tried to focus on that and maybe find a job in there? Um, it's a competitive field at this point, you know, it's kind of saturated, but I just decided like, well, I'm just going to go for it and we'll just see what happens. I mean, you know, when I was a mediator, before I became a mediator, I remember being told by my former boss at the time that like the mediation department was really small. There were like 12 people. And he was like, it's really hard to get in there. People don't get in there. And I remember telling him, I was like, yeah, I know, but I'm going to. <laughs> and then I graduated. We love that and confidence. They, and they offered me a job. And that was like, you know, back in like 2012 or something. So, you know, I, I 
was like, I've made it like it's happened before. Like I've put that energy out there and things have shifted and I've done stuff and it's happened before. Like, why can't I just do that again? So I decided to start studying for the associate professional human resources exam um, certification. (laughs) Such a mouthful. Yeah. (laughs) The APHR. (laughs) Um, Okay certification. And I decided to sign up for that in early October while I was still looking, I was still at my former job, but I thought like, I need movement. Like I need energy. That's not just looking at LinkedIn or indeed or Mm -hmm. whatever local job boards, wherever, like I need something that's different than just trying to find a job and apply for it and like hope for the best. Like I just need something else. And so I started doing that in early October. And I remember like a week later, I had like one of the worst work days I've had in such a long time. I was sobbing like the whole day and I was dealing with really, really difficult clients. And I remember, (laughs) I remember I just had a moment in the middle of the day and I just like stopped and I took a breath and I was like, this is unacceptable. And I am done here. I am no longer working here. And I remember saying like, okay, universe, I don't know what that looks like, but you're going to do it. Like you have to figure it out because Mm -hmm. I'm telling you now I'm done. I can't, I'm right. I'm not going to keep doing this. This is the most unacceptable way of being treated. I'm not doing it. I'm absolutely done. And I wrote the little note. I put it in my little box. Like Tosha Silver says. She's doing her homework. Doing my homework. <laughs> and I remember telling um, my husband, Tony, too. I was like, "That's I'm done. Like, it, I'm just done. I can't keep doing this. I don't, I literally don't know what that looks like, but I, I'm just, I'm telling you too. Like, I'm just done. Yes. And that doesn't mean I'm quitting right now, but like, I'm done. I, I literally didn't know what it meant. I just knew that like your soul knew I am. I am. This is over. Yes. It was literally like a, on a very spiritual level for me, like in my core, in my bones, like in the marrow of my being, (laughs) it was like, this is we're No, this is it. We're done. And, And I said that. And like a couple of days later, I was looking on, LinkedIn, just randomly at jobs. And I found one that was local to me. And you know this, I live pretty rurally in Oregon and there are not a lot of jobs (laughs) that come up out here. And I had originally really wanted something that was still remote. That's what I'd been doing like before the pandemic. So, um, you know, I really like working from home. Of course, like I'm an introverted person. (laughs) You know, I had had some rough commutes before at previous jobs. So, but this job was like in person, 20 minutes away. It was listed as a part-time temporary HR assistant position for this local organization through like a recruiting agency. And I was like, okay, what what do I have to lose at this point? Yeah. I don't care if it's part-time, I'll figure something out financially. I'll, it's temporary. I'll do it like, I don't care. <laughs> exactly. It's temporary. It's a great opportunity to maybe gain some skills in the HR field, like while I'm, you know, studying for this exam. Um, so that way when the time comes to like find a permanent job, I've got it on my resume and it looks like I'm hey, taking this kind of seriously, like I'm actually interested in human resources. So I applied for it on a Sunday. I sent in my resume. Two days later, I got a call from the recruiter. Three days later, I had an interview. And like another four days later, I was offered the job. And it was just so wild how fast it turned around. And then I they needed somebody to start like as soon as possible. And so I gave like a two-week notice at my job. And then by late November, I was working at this new place. It's a great organization. It, um, I, ironically or not, I don't know if it's coincidental or not, but of course it's an organization that actually helps folks in the community who are struggling with like significant mental health crises or issues, Mm. um, and, or 
addiction um, or substance mm. abuse needs, you know, they've got issues around that. And so it's like a really great organization that, you know, it's work that I'm passionate about. It's work that I'm familiar with, you know, just from my own personal <laughs> like life with family members mm. with addiction. And, and the nice thing was I was going to be working like in the human resources side. So not client facing, but like internal clients, you know, with like employees. So I started it at the end of November and literally like a week and a half later, (laughs) my HR director said, okay, so the HR generalist that's here is applying for interviewing for this job internally and is gone. Like she got the job. She's going to be leaving. Like, are you open to learning her role? Which was stuff that I had never learned before with human resources, stuff like leave administration, you know, ADA accommodations, like stuff like that, where like there are laws in place and it's a big learning curve. But I was like, I mean, sure. <laughs> like, why not? Right. I'm here. I've got lots of support. So I started doing that. And then they opened up the HR generalist job to the public because they're required to as a government entity. And I was not sure if I wanted to apply for it. I was kind of scared. It felt outside of my comfort zone a little bit because of the sort of like, you know, I'm still like a recovering perfectionist and the idea of getting something wrong about something big that also has laws behind it feels scary for me. But I decided to apply for it anyways, because that was true with the fertility industry. And I managed that just fine. And then... You also managed to raise your parents and yourself and your siblings. So I think... Touche. (laughs) So I think you managed... I think you can do this job. (laughs) Yeah, that's fair. I guess that's fair. I don't... (laughs) Just say it. Yeah. Okay. I'll take that. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) So I... Yeah, I interviewed for it at the end of December. So I had been in the temp position for one month and I interviewed for it end of December. And then like a few days later, like, okay, great. You've got the job. I was like, okay, what? So you went from a part-time temporary, you know, like assistant level job, right? To like a full-time, not temporary. Nope. Permanent. Like big girl. (laughs) Big girl, big girl job. I got a big girl job. And in a month. Yeah. In like one month. It's just so, yeah, it is wild. And it's like, like crazy good benefits, right? Like really incredible, like retirement account benefits, incredible paid time off. Um, like we only work 37 and a half hours a week. Amazing. It's not, it's not, but I'm salaried. So I get paid. It's like, you know, it's like the most money that I've made at like any job. Really good, like dental health benefits that like my husband gets to be on now. I'm just, That's it's, great. It's a wild, yeah, it's a dream. Like it's, and it's, you know, the thing that I keep thinking is like, it's challenging on Sundays because there's so much for me to learn. But I have so much support from my HR director and from my team. And the organization itself, like, it's just a really great place to be. It's a really great place to learn how to do this stuff and to also, Mm -hmm. you know, like, really dip my toes into, like, human resources for a while and see how I manage and what I like about it or what I don't like about it or if I want to stay in it long term or transition out. And, you know, I was having this thought earlier today I remember, I think during one of our sessions, I had mentioned something about like feeling so deflated at the fact that this dream job that I had originally had in the fertility industry ended up becoming like a nightmare. And like, how does that happen? Like, you know, when you get something that's supposed to be your dream, like, isn't it supposed to stay that way? And I just like had this kind of like miniature epiphany today that was like, of course not. (laughs) Like nothing, even like the best things that happen to us don't necessarily last forever, right? Like Mm -mm. good people that come into our lives, you know, beloved animals. I Mm -hmm. I mean, jobs, like nothing, nothing. Everything is is temporary. Everything is temporary. And that's, 
something that I'm still having to learn how to accept because I've kind of just always had this mindset that like, you know, once you have a goal and you get there, like, that's it. You've done done it. it. Check that off your list. You're good forever. (laughs) And it's like, okay. And now what? And then what happens if it doesn't work out, Mm -hmm. you know, and it did for a while. And I think just kind of realizing that things that are meant to be are still meant to be even when they no longer seem like they're Mm -hmm. for you anymore or they're not working out how you thought that they would anymore. Yeah. And yeah. So I'm just, I'm kind of trying to take that with me into this new job, right? Like right now it feels like an incredible opportunity. And so I'm just trying to be present with that. And that's a big growth area for me is really being present and enjoying like what I have right now instead of future tripping on Mm -hmm. like how it might change or shift into something that I don't like anymore. So yeah, that's kind of like, that's that's sort of, that's that's it. (laughs) (laughs) That's my story. (laughs) Hope you liked it. (laughs) But thank you for saying that because it's so true that like everything is just for now. And the more comfortable we can get with that, the better. Mm -hmm. Because, Mm -hmm. and, and just because something was once good and then it turned or like something changed about it and it was no longer good. Um, or we got bored or we got a new boss and that boss is like crazy. It like, Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that it didn't work out. I think that it, it's so limiting to think things only work out if I define them as good. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, no things worked out. If you had the experience you were meant to have. Right. And like, it's up to you to decide ultimately, like, if you believe that every experience you have is one you're meant to have. And I'm kind of, and I think you are too, like sort of on that boat. Like either Mm -hmm. everything is meaningful or nothing is meaningful. You kind of (laughs) can't pick and choose. Yeah. And so I'm on the boat of like, well, I just believe that like life couldn't have happened any other way. And that the good, the bad, the ugly, the weird, like it was all kind of part of my life's journey. And it was all part of like, yeah, what I'm supposed to be learning and integrating and, processing. And so just because it didn't work out, quote unquote, doesn't mean it wasn't right. And just because it didn't last forever doesn't mean it wasn't exactly what was supposed to be, you know? And so, yes, for now, this job is great. It is exactly where you're supposed to be. And you feel the alignment of that Mm -hmm. and the rightness of that. And one day it might feel misaligned or it might not feel quite so right. And you will cross that bridge when you come to it. And to be honest, it would be weird if it didn't, if that didn't happen because you're going to keep growing and evolving and changing and other people do too. And circumstances change. And then like, there will be something else that's Mm -hmm. more aligned that you will step into next. And that's growth. And like, yeah, you wouldn't, I I just don't think you would not want that. Like, of course you're going to want to grow. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've kind of always been the type of person that I can't really see myself being at like one job for the rest of my life, which is interesting for like a thriver. thriver? I I, I highly crave stability. I want that. I need that. Um, You know, but I also like, there is a part of me that, you know, also really craves growth, which I think is natural for anybody, even thrivers. (laughs) We can still grow, yeah, we even, can still yes, change can. and want Absolutely. You know, to do scary things that feels outside of our comfort zone. Um, and I think that's kind of where I'm at. It's like, yeah, I don't expect this job to be forever. <laughs> this is a government agency. Like, who knows? They might get shut down <laughs> you know, like 10 years. You just like, don't know what, yeah. what the landscape is going to look like at any given point in time. So I'm just really focusing on just being grateful that like I've got it right now and I'm growing into some great skills and, you know, already Mm -hmm. being trusted to be like an expert on things by my HR director, which is like so cool to have somebody who's, you know, like, yeah, you go off, you do your thing. I'm even going to come to you and ask you questions (laughs) because I don't know them. And if you don't really know them, that's fine. Like, let's go find the answer. And yeah, I think just having that permission to like, I don't know, 
make mistakes, but also grow and become like an expert at something. It's an, it's a really exciting place for me to be. Is your HR director a woman? Yeah. <laughs> you broke the pattern. Of course she is. Of course. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Well, I figured, but I just had to make sure. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, okay. And finally you were able to break the pattern and now you have a female authority figure in your life. Who's like actually nurturing. <laughs> And yeah, like, it's so interesting. Yeah. She's it's like a really great balance of like nurturing and also um like I don't know, sort of speaking her mind and saying things, but like also prefacing it with like, okay, I'm gonna say this. I'm sorry if it sounds this way. It's not meant to be. You can tell me that it's not right if I'm saying it this way. You know, right. somebody who's like genuinely open to feedback and yeah. Thrives on having that feedback herself, wants to give that feedback to me and to my team members as, you know, as a measure of like helping us grow and build our skills and confidence. It's just, yeah, it's really nice to have that balance. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for being um, <laughs> an example of someone who like did the real work, like, like delved and for many years before I really knew you, you know, like <laughs> yeah. was delving into the crap mm -hmm. and like healing your wounds on a really deep level and like breaking patterns, like mm -hmm. healing generational trauma, and then eventually reaping the reward of that in that you broke the pattern and life is a lot better. And mm -hmm. the things you're a match to now are so much healthier than what you used to be a match to. And that's yeah. like a testament to how much work that you have put in. And, you know, I know that you, a few months back, six, seven months ago, were afraid that the universe only shined on other people and not you. But I think we are pleased to report the universe also shines on Kayla. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I I mean, I think that is a great place to put a bow on this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I have I've loved every minute of this. Like, I think this was so important, this whole conversation. I think it was important for everyone listening, but I think it was most important for you and me. Yes. <laughs> to like have that, I don't know, to reflect on your journey and how far you've come. And then just the fact that other people get to benefit from this conversation is just like the cherry on top. Yeah. So thank you for being so open and willing to talk about like the good and the bad and the ugly and the weird <laughs> of your <laughs> journey. Yeah. Um, because I think it's really probably helped and normalized a lot of these similar experiences that we don't often hear out loud for other people too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. I love it. <laughs> um, all right. Well. You obviously, I would love to hear, and I'm sure you would too, Kayla, from anyone who resonated with this. So, like, I hope that you know people will leave a comment, and um, if they do, I'll make sure you see it so that okay. you can be kept in the loop of people <laughs> who sure. are uh, resonating with you. Yeah. Um, so, thank you again for being here. Thank you, Rachel. All right, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Kayla. I'm sure there was a lot of good stuff in it. Again, I haven't had it as of the time we're recording this outro. I don't typically do that, but this is just how it worked we're out. We're getting That's, ahead of ourselves. Yeah, it just happened this time. I'm sure she would love to hear your feedback. So if you relate, please leave a comment. Like you can go to the link in the show notes and go to where this lives on our site and leave a comment. If or you can just go to clarityonfire.com and go to the podcast tab. And this will be the most recent episode if you're listening to it when it came out. And, uh, oh, Kristen, are you excited about the Super Bowl this weekend? And really, there's only one reason I'm asking you this. <laughs> this is not a question that you would usually ask me on any given year. Absolutely not. Because normally, we don't even really know when the Super Bowl is. The last time I cared about the Super Bowl was when Destiny's Child performed. Mm, I mean, that was a good halftime yeah. performance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this time, I you am, better believe. I, I mean, am. will I watch the actual Super Bowl? Of course not. Well, I, I mean, think I will because I want to. Uh, it's Taylor Swift Super Bowl. That's true. She's going to be all if she's there. It. Fingers well, crossed that she makes it back I from Tokyo. I just I feel like she will. She's just that kind of girl, you yeah. know. And I can't. I think she'll be there for her man. I absolutely. You have to do it. <laughs> to do the it. world is watching. The world is waiting and watching. I might piss off Joseph by wearing my Eras Tour outfit. <laughs>
<laughs> and like not telling him that I'm going to do it. Do it. And then just do putting it. it on. And then he's going to be like, what the hell have you done? And you I'm like, this is Taylor Swift. laugh at you. Someone on Instagram. In Insta- a endearing way, I'm sure. Someone on Instagram today said, are you guys ready for the Arrows Bowl? And I'm like, <laughs> absolutely, I am. I love it. Um, yeah, this is the the one rare year that you and I care. will care about the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, listen. I, I but that's really, true about a lot, a lot more than just us. So this will yeah. be the highest. I bet you this will be Absol- the highest. There's no. This will b- blow audience. ratings out of the water for the Super Bowl, which is already I know. incredible. I know. I, I'm just over also all of the quote dads, chads, and brads who are like this ruined the NFL, and I'm like the NFL loves this. It's made them so much are money. Are you kidding? The actual corporate NFL I is loving love it. this. They love it. Yes. She's brought in a whole new also, viewers someone, who never cared. Someone posted about, the about like, oh, this is the worst thing that happened to the NFL. Not all of the guys who have like been charged with domestic violence or like dog fighting rings. Right. You know right. what I mean? Like, no, 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 that wasn't that bad. It's Taylor Swift. That's what ruined the NFL for you. Get the fuck out of here. So get 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 out of town, dads, brads, and chads. <laughs> in fact, you should be thrilled. Now your girlfriends and wives well, care. will happily watch the Super, the Super Bowl. Bowl with you. Right. Like you don't have to convince this us is anymore. Win. This is they are healing a divide between men and women. Exactly. Which I don't, you know. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> and I think love is beautiful. And I think Taylor Swift finding love with a man who's six mm-hmm. five and really good at his work and isn't intimidated by her is also beautiful. And all is all about her. Really, and... this this rant was overdue because you know, we've been on hiatus while all of this was happening. I know, how have we not talked about it? Well, exactly. It was time to talk about it. And so in this outro of Kayla's episode is where I'm... Right, Kayla. <laughs> you know what? I don't think Kayla's mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah. obviously, yeah. We'll in, in case anyone here was wondering, you know, really, like, I needed Rachel and Kristen's take. I'm not... I'm not complete until I hear Rachel and Kristen's take on Taylor and Travis. Obviously, we're all for it. We couldn't be more for 100% it. 100% for. I am a thousand percent for it. <laughs> and I believe that they will be engaged this year. I hope Absolutely. so. Absolutely. Oh. I, I just feel it. I know it. Um, that would make me so happy. Yeah. Make also, the world happy. Also, do it for the world, Taylor. Do it for the, like, please. I know. Really, Travis. I know. Travis. I mean, go on. I, I think he, I don't I don't think he I mean I think he's like I think he go. knows what he's got yeah let's go I, I agree <laughs> lock this down I, I completely agree so okay anyway also okay one last thing yesterday I was talking to uh our friend Amanda and she was like Rachel do you think sometimes about how you and Joseph met at like the exact same time that Taylor and Travis met and I was like every day <laughs> <laughs> the start of a line and she was like it's so significant and I'm like it really is <laughs> <laughs> she's like sometimes i'm just in the shower and i'm like wow <laughs> she's thinking about yeah that's so she thinks about that uh, i'm like i agree love Amanda. me and taylor being on like a similar like synchronous path mm. i'm like th- this just feels me right. it feels exactly right <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh that's so i good. i did that's tell good. joseph that the other day and he rolled his eyes <laughs> he was like well then like what if they break up though what is that gonna and, I, mm. and i'm like Mm, that's not relevant to you. He was like, but then what if things go really well for them? And I'm like, that is relevant to you. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, oh my God. We can pick and choose. Why not? (laughs) (laughs) So good. Uh, Okay. Well, sorry, Kayla, but also not sorry, because we had to talk about it at some point. It time. Past time. Okay. So with that, we will all be watching the Super Bowl. (laughs) Happy Arrows Bowl. (laughs) Avidly this weekend. (laughs) And we'll be back next week with a side chat. Yeah, a new side chat. Mm -hmm. All right. See you then. Bye.